Since 1957, great care had been taken to ensure that Raleigh Ashlyn Skelton, commonly known as Peter, of the British Museum, was the only person with truly relevant expertise to examine the Vinland map in detail. Even the one expert to whom Skelton had privately shown a photo, retired Professor Eva Taylor, had swiftly confirmed his worries that the accurate delineation of Greenland would have been impossible in the Middle Ages. The Yale University Press strategy for the book launch would help to reduce the risk that one of the many experts who would be seeing pictures of the map could immediately prove it was a fake. In essence, with the blessing of Paul Mellon, sponsor of the book, the Vinland map was to hit the world like a thunderbolt. The launch was planned for the newly designated Leif Eriksson Day, 9th October 1965, but that was a Saturday, so the following Monday, 11th of October, was chosen instead to give maximum scope for press follow-up activity. As the Tuesday, 12th October, was Columbus Day, the anniversary of the 1492 landing which many in the general population, unlike historians, celebrated as the first rather than the last discovery of the New World, the launch would also be massively controversial for reasons utterly unrelated to the authenticity of the map. The plan worked brilliantly. The American media were carried away with the wonder of the occasion, and the first reviews of the book were almost unanimously favourable. Particularly impressive were the way the Vincent de Beauvais manuscript, which had been the missing link in proving the authenticity of the map, was linked by its watermarked paper to the Church Council of Basel in the 1430s. Also, the way Peter Skelton, a renowned and conscientious scholar, had taken care to address issues like the uncannily accurate shape of Greenland. In addition, some reviewers praised the decision to give George Painter space for an essay expressing alternative hypotheses on various issues. Of those who were less enthusiastic, the most vocal were the Italian and Hispanic Americans and their cousins in Europe. As a result, it appeared that criticism of the Vinland map and of the newly published book was based largely on sour grapes about Columbus. What was much less obvious in the frenzy was the reaction among Skelton's peers in England and among Scandinavian scholars who might be expected to welcome the newly revealed map. They were in a position to see something the huge publicity campaign was hiding, the simple reality that Skelton's expertise on the great age of European exploration in the 15th and 16th centuries was largely irrelevant to the story of Norse exploration hundreds of years earlier. He had no first-hand knowledge of the Scandinavian historical sources in their original Old Norse language, or of recent Scandinavian scholarship in the Norwegian, Icelandic, Swedish and Danish languages. Similarly, Thomas Marston was a pure amateur in the study of medieval manuscripts, with access to only a tiny sample of genuine documents for comparative purposes. In particular, his claim in the new book that the writing on the Vinland map was by the same medieval scribe as the writing in its companion manuscripts was challenged by experts who were reluctant to make a firm pronouncement because they needed to see the original documents rather than photographs. Controversy did wonders for sales of the book, which sold out its first print run of 5,000 hardback copies at $15 each in about five weeks. Not only was a second run of 5,000 printed, the Book of the Month Club also made it their selection for March 1966. If Paul Mellon was entitled to a share of the profits in return for his financing of the publication, he would be doing very nicely. Meanwhile, in view of the academic concerns, the Smithsonian Institution stepped in, and Wilcom Washburn of the Department of American Studies, who had commented in his own 1966 review of the 1965 book, how many reviewers seemed to have been attacking the public reaction to the book rather than the book itself, convened a conference to be held in November 1966, by which time even academic journals which were only published annually had time to review the 1965 book. Three of the book's authors, Peter Skelton, Thomas Marston and Alexander Vita, attended the conference, along with Lawrence Witten, who had bought the map in Europe, and dozens of experts in various relevant fields. On behalf of Yale, Marston announced an extraordinary new discovery that, shortly before the conference, 
the offset of a document from the Council of Basel had been discovered in the cover of the Vincent of Bove volume, apparently as a result of preparation for display at the conference. The word apparently crops up a great deal in this story, and here we go again. In 1995, George Painter claimed that the purpose of the work had been to put the book's covers, which had been swapped back to front and thus turned upside down at some time before it came to America, back in their correct positions. If that was the intention, it was not carried out, as the covers are still wrong today. When historian Kirsten Seaver asked the Yale libraries for details of the work, they were unable to find any record of it. Libraries of that status do not normally carry out any work on medieval manuscripts without keeping detailed records. So Mrs. Seaver speculated that the end papers might have been peeled back before the volume was donated to Yale by Paul Mellon. That would imply some sort of effort by Yale to keep scholars from seeing the peeled back end papers between October 1965 and November 1966. So take your pick of unlikely scenarios. Whatever the truth, the revelation gave the conference a good boost, but the experts asked some very awkward questions, particularly of Lawrence Witten. Whenever necessary, he lied, shamelessly and consistently, most blatantly in his detailed description of the library from which he claimed he had bought the map volume. More useful, in sometimes curious ways, were the responses from the three authors of the 1965 book. Alexander Vita, who had been in charge of the team, tended to give slightly different answers from Marston and Skelton. For example, in describing how Paul Mellon started the book project, Vita said he did not impose any form of secrecy. But Marston said the owner asked Messrs Skelton, Vita and myself to prepare the manuscript for publication in strict secrecy. Note that Marston's statement also implies that as far as he was concerned, the purpose of the work was not authentication of the Vinland map, and on that matter Vita agreed in 1966, stating that the private owner asked that the Yale University Library arrange in some way to have this map published. Only when the private owner was officially revealed as Paul Mellon in 1996, after all of the writing team except Painter were dead, did the story change to hint at the underlying tax strategy. He would not donate it to the library until it had been authenticated. He would loan it to the library for examination by suitable experts. Although Lawrence Witten's lies and omissions propped up the case for authenticity, other key planks were exposed as rotten. In particular, the lack of any scientific input to the 1965 book was a matter for deep concern. The book authors and Witten assured the conference that they had examined the map under ultraviolet light, finding no evidence of erased writing, and that microscopic examination confirmed the wormholes were not artificial. However, there was a feeling that scientists with the relevant expertise might have a great deal more to say. As the map was due to be displayed in London a couple of months after the conference, Yale agreed that it should be subjected to non-destructive tests at the British Museum, while the Smithsonian asked a young staff scientist named Jacqueline Owen to consider long-term possibilities for testing. Although the British Museum saw no reason to take out special insurance for the map, it was also to visit Oslo, for which purpose it was reportedly insured with the Lloyds of London for the equivalent of $4.2 million, and other Northwest European capitals. The opening of the London exhibition, attended of course by Peter Skelton and George Painter, was covered in the British press on 20th January 1967. Skelton confirmed that the British Museum Research Laboratory had examined the map and its companion documents in detail over the preceding couple of weeks, and that Yale had undertaken to publish the results, whether favourable or unfavourable. It seems to have been Painter, in very chatty mood, who let slip to a reporter from The Guardian that the map ink had been found to lack iron, a fact which did not worry him. Anne Taylor of The Observer, who had earlier followed the trial of Enzo Ferraioli, the Spanish book dealer who had sold the map to Lawrence Witten, picked up on this and began asking pertinent questions of museum staff. Although they probably advised her to wait for Yale's publication of the full report, they did provide a little bit more information, which she published early in February. 
initially in the Observer, but also in the Washington Post a week later. Although the map ink showed no traces of iron in its composition, the two companion documents, as Painter had somewhat vaguely implied, did use iron-based ink like nearly all medieval European documents, and mistakenly attributed to Skelton the suggestion from an anonymous scientist that the basis of the map ink could be something like lamp black, burnt bone or dried blood. What the press did not hear, but Kirsten Seaver later discovered from internal correspondence, was that the documents had also been examined by two manuscript experts who had not studied the map volume on its brief visit to the British Museum in 1957. Theodore Skeet, the museum's new keeper of manuscripts, and Neil Kerr, compiler of the definitive catalogue of medieval manuscripts in British libraries, both advised Skelton and Painter, after examining all three linked documents, that the writing on the map was definitely not by the same person as the Speculum manuscript or the Historia Tartarorum. Kerr, like Bertram Schofield back in 1957, stated specifically that the map handwriting was later than the others. Mm -hmm.